Hello, and welcome to another episode of True Crime Tea Time, where I delve into some of the darkest corners of human behavior concerning crimes that have shocked and captivated the nation. Murder is one of the deadliest sins, and even in the Bible, the Lord says, thou shall not kill. One of the most heinous things that you can do is to kill a young woman and a child. To do something like that definitely makes you a different type of evil. Religious cults have been a part of human history, and while many religious cults tend to be harmless, there are some that are extremely dangerous. And one of the most dangerous things associated with cults tend to be the cult leaders themselves. A lot of these people are extremely charismatic. They have just really nice, fun personalities that literally draws people in just like bees to honey. But you have to be very careful so that way you don't get entangled in their trap. Cult leaders often resort to violence to maintain control of their followers. And the cult leader that we're gonna talk about today is a man named Peter Lucas Moses Jr. He belonged to a religious set called the Black Hebrew Israelites. He ended up turning his religious set called the Black Hebrew Israelites into his own personal female cult. So haunting, so chilling. Come quick, the tea here is spilling. If you want it, then come to me. Discuss the crimes and the unsolved mysteries. It's true crime tea time. It's dark history. It's true crime tea time. The Black Hebrew Israelites believe that African Americans are descendants of ancient Israelites. They also tend to incorporate varying degrees of Judaism and Christianity into their religious doctrine. But ultimately, Peter would corrupt this and use this sect as a way to manipulate many women under his control and eventually kill a woman named Antonetta Netta McCoy and a young boy named Jaden Higginbotham. Antonetta McCoy fondly called Netta by her friends and family, grew up in a single mother household in Washington, D.C. with two of her siblings in the projects. Growing up in the projects of Washington, D.C. definitely was not easy for Netta and her siblings, but even though she grew up in a rough environment, a lot of her friends stated that Netta was super sweet, super caring, and always checked on them to make sure that they were doing okay. Netta was also the type of person, because she was so sweet, she tended to come off a bit naive, um, friends also said that she wouldn't curse, um, she wouldn't sometimes take up for herself. So a lot of times her siblings had to protect her when it came to certain situations. And unfortunately for Netta, being a good hearted person sometimes doesn't allow you to stand out in a good way. So this led to bullying, people picking on her, people trying to take advantage of her. And unfortunately, because of this, this took a toll on her self-esteem and she became more reserved and just really, you know, stayed in the house. And it was at that point that she found God and she started really getting into the Bible and, you know, just becoming more religious because she felt like the outside world was a bit too dangerous for her to navigate. She would pray and talk to God all the times about her feelings and the things that she was going through. And she also spent a lot of time at church as well. So later on in life, Netta went to the doctor only to find out that she was infertile. She had really wanted to start a family and have children, but she was unable to get pregnant. And so she went to God and prayed for something to help her, something to get her out of this depression. All she wanted was a family. And soon, somebody would answer her prayers, but it wasn't God. So one day Netta decided to get on Facebook and she ended up getting a message from a guy that she went to high school with named Peter. And when Netta was younger, she did have a you know crush on Peter. A lot of the girls liked him. He was very charismatic. He had a way with words. And so she was extremely flattered that Peter would be in her inbox, DMing her and wanting to find out more about her life and what she was up to you know, ever since high school ended. So at this point, Netta is spending a lot of time on Facebook. She's even spending more time on Facebook talking to Peter than she is in her Bible. Now, the reason why she was talking to Peter a whole lot, because she found out that he was just as religious as she was, and she thought that she found a kindred soul. Because in the hood, it is hard to find a lot of people who are more religious or into the Bible. They're more involved in other earthly things than they are in the Bible. 
So for her to find a guy who was just as into the Bible as she was, Netta looked at it as a blessing, but her mother felt a way about Peter. Her mother felt like something just wasn't right, that he was running a bunch of game. But Netta didn't really want to listen because, again, she's been kind of stuck in the house. You know, she hasn't really been entertaining too many people. A lot of people kind of felt like she was kind of timid and weird and people took advantage of her. So as soon as she found, you know, what she assumed was a friend in Peter, it's like she was so smitten by him. But her mother was definitely concerned about this new blossoming relationship. So one of the things that definitely drew Netta to Peter is the fact that Peter had a huge online following. Well, what she thought was huge, honey. He was definitely, you know, a religious influencer and he would preach. And a lot of times he'd be on video preaching at his church in North Carolina. So that just made her feel like, you know what, this connection was meant to be. He's a preacher. You know, he has all of these followers. He's preaching the good word. So this made Netta even more smitten over Peter. So because of this new devotion to Peter and this relationship, Peter finally asked Netta to be his girlfriend, and she was super happy. She felt like this is, you know, what I've been waiting for. This is what I've been praying for. She felt that eventually she would be the first lady of the church. So Netta was just, you know, she was head over heels over Peter. This was the man that she had dreamed of her whole life. So eventually they grew further in love. They would take weekend getaways. She would go down to Durham to go spend time with Peter. And Peter would also come up to Washington, D.C. to visit her as well. Well, eventually, Peter asked her to move down to Durham, North Carolina. He felt like the long-distance relationship was becoming a bit too much, and he wanted to be with Netta full-time. And so at this point, Netta felt like, you know what? We've been dating now for a few months. I really like him. He's a perfect man. I'm willing to, you know, take a chance on love and basically leave my comfort of my home, my mother, my siblings, and go down to North Carolina to be with Peter Moses. So now the big day comes and Netta moves down to dorm North Carolina. Again, her mother was really apprehensive, but by this time Netta was grown. She was about 26, 27 years old. So, you know, what all could her mother do? So Netta gets there, she's super excited. She has her suitcase, she's ready to unpack. But as soon as she walks in, she sees all of these different shoes at the door and they're all like a wide variety of sizes. So now Netta is kind of concerned, like, well, whose shoes are these? Some of them are girl shoes, some are little boy shoes, some are little girl shoes, some are women's shoes. And then there's only one pair of man shoes. So Netta's like, what's up with this, Peter? And at that point, Peter decides to drop the bomb on Netta. But before Peter can drop the bomb on Netta, Peter's so-called aunt named LaRonda tells Netta that she cannot sleep in the bedroom with Peter. Even though this is her husband, they're not legally married, and this does not look right in God's eyes. So LaRonda, who is Peter's aunt, tells Netta, you need to sleep in this room, and this will be your room going forward until you and Peter get married. So like they say, everything that happens in the dark eventually comes to the light. So Netta is settling into her new surroundings. She's settling into the home. And she's noticing that Peter has a lot of aunties, you know, that are just kind of coming in and out. They're there all the time. And, you know, Peter does these sermons and these women come into the home and they're listening to Peter preach. And he is preaching, honey. He's preaching the gospel. He has everyone mesmerized, not only in the room, but also on video on Facebook. Because, again, he also has followers on the Internet who tune into his sermons as well. So Peter is doing a whole bunch of preaching. And Netta is just like, wow, this is my man. You know, he's doing his thing. He just speaks to my spirit. So Netta is eating all of this up. So then finally, about two weeks in, Peter decides to drop the bomb on Netta. And Peter tells Netta that LaRonda is not his aunt and all the women who are coming to the, you know, the Sunday service are not the aunties and the cousins and all that stuff, but that all of these women are Peter's wives. So now Netta is shocked, but once again, Peter is using religion to basically coax Netta 
and to drop her guards. And he's saying, you know, in the Bible, um, you know, there are many men in the Bible who had multiple wives and he's trying to basically convert her into this whole polyamorous lifestyle. And Netta was very uncomfortable with this because she thought Peter was just her man. She had no idea that Peter was married to all these women. There were different children in the household. So at this point, Netta feels like, you know, I think it's time for me to go. This is not for me. But all of the wives start talking to Netta and saying that they really love her and, you know, they see her on the same level as a Peter and they just want to welcome her in. And because Netta was infertile, she also fell in love with a lot of the children there as well. And she thought to herself, well, maybe this is what, you know, God has in store for me because she found out she was infertile. She prayed for her family. She prayed for God to open up another window. So Netta thought, well, maybe this is it. Maybe I'm not meant to be a biological mother, but maybe I'm meant to mother these children and to help out in this religious sect. So Netta ends up basically falling for Peter and all of these women's games, and she ends up deciding to stay and marry Peter in a ceremony. So Peter definitely has a unique way of running his household, and basically he wants all of these women to address him as Lord and see him as a godlike figure. And all of the women, they definitely fall in line. So Netta's job is to basically help homeschool the children and take care of them. So while Netta is doing this, she ends up forming a really close relationship with this little boy named Jaden. And Jaden is Vania's son by somebody else. So he is not Peter's biological son. And so Netta kind of felt like Jaden was always kind of being mistreated, being punished a lot more harsher than the other children. So she definitely took a real close liking to Jaden because, again, she was the newbie in the set and Jaden kind of was treated like the outcast. So he really clung to her even more than he clung to his mother, Vania. Now, it is believed that one of the reasons why, you know, the women and Peter really shunned Jaden is because Jaden's father had dated Vania when they were in high school and um, she ended up getting pregnant. And so what ended up happening is that a few years later, Jaden's father, Jamil, came out the closet that he was gay. So being gay in the Black Hebrew Israelite movement is definitely a no-no. It is frowned upon. So because Jaden's biological father came out as a homosexual man, Peter always felt that Jaden picked up some funny ways from his father. So he was always scrutinizing him. The way he walked, the way he handed over toys, the way he ate with his food, he scrutinized him more than the other children because he felt like maybe Jaden's father's gay genes may have been passed down to him. And because of this, Jaden was always punished unfairly. And, you know, the things that he went through was basically abuse. I mean, he was always being beat on, cussed at. He was treated really bad because Peter felt deep down inside he may have this gay gene. Now, the sad thing is that none of these women were ever allowed to question Peter. They were never allowed to stick up for Jaden or say that Peter was wrong. They had to just fall in line with whatever punishment that Peter decided to doll out to not only Jaden, but to any of the wives or any of the children that were part of this religious sect. The wives were also not allowed to tell Peter no, and this included with intercourse. It didn't matter if Peter wanted sex from any of the women, they were obligated to give him sex. Now, what was very interesting about their sexual arrangement is that Peter oftentimes would rotate between the women. All of the sex was unprotected. So he's allowed to sleep with multiple women and get them pregnant, but all of these women have to wait on him hand and foot. Now, what's also interesting is that these women are not allowed to tell him no. So if they were to tell Peter no, Peter would put hands on them. So now Peter has basically been sleeping with Netta now for months. Um, the other women are getting pregnant. Some of these kids who are being born are literally two and three months apart. But the whole time he's been sleeping with Netta, Netta still has not gotten pregnant. And Netta at this point is too scared and ashamed to tell Peter that she's infertile. So Peter's not understanding, you know, like why is she not getting pregnant? Everybody else is on child number two and three. Meanwhile, she's been here for a while and nothing is happening. 
So eventually he starts taking his frustrations of Netta not getting pregnant out on her. And he ends up punching her in her face, giving her black eyes, even at one point in time, almost breaking her jaw because she's unable to conceive and bear him a child. Now, what's very disturbing is that at some point in time, Peter's thirst for power starts going crazy and he starts demanding that the wives start performing sexual acts on each other. Now, let me get this straight. This is a man who's so scared about little Jaden, you know, having the gay gene because of his father. But somehow this same deviant man does not mind forcing women to perform sex acts on each other. I'm confused here. Isn't homosexuality homosexuality? Regardless if it's two men or two women, you're still engaging in homosexuality. So if it's against your religion, if this is such a bad thing, why does he not have any issues forcing these women to perform all sex and other sexual acts on each other? This just shows you how much of a hypocrite Peter is. He hates gay male sex, but he has no problem engaging in gay female sex. Again, the hypocrisy of these cult leaders know no bounds. So now as time is going on, like I said, the other ladies are falling pregnant. They're all going on baby number two and three, but Netta is still not pregnant and the punishments are becoming more severe. And Peter is basically abusing her at this point. At one point, it got so bad that he knocked out Netta's tooth. And so once he knocked out her tooth, Netta began to cry. And she didn't want to sleep with him anymore. Because who wants to keep giving their body to somebody who is physically abusing them? That doesn't make you feel sexy. That doesn't want to make you, you know, have sex with that person. That makes you want to cower in fear and stay away from that person. But again, Peter does not allow for these women to tell him no. So he basically condemns her beats on her and forces her to perform all sex on him, even with the missing tooth. And then at that point, Peter begins to lose it and he grabs a gun and he puts it to Netta's head and he basically forces her to give him head under the rest of her being shot in the head with a gun. So once the gun comes out, Netta is understanding the severity of her situation. She's been here now close to two years, and she's realizing that this situation is not a situation that she prayed for, and that Peter is not the man that God sent to her. Peter is basically a devil. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. So one day, Netta finally gets the strength to pack up her bags and leave. While all the sister wives were at work and Netta was supposed to be watching the children, she packed up her belongings. She called her mother and asked, could she come back to D.C.? to stay with her mother. And her mother was like, yes, of course, you know what I'm saying? Come back. So when Netta comes back, she tells her mother, not all of the abuse, because you know a lot of that stuff is private, it's embarrassing, but she tells her mother that she's not being treated right and that Peter has all these wives that he wasn't honest about. And the mother says, you know, I told you there was something about him that was just really sneaky. I wasn't feeling him. I've always felt that he was a very dishonest person. So Netta is seeking solace with her family and her family is there to protect her. So now Netta is now in DC with her family and it's been about a month and Peter is calling, trying to talk her to come back down South to North Carolina. But you know, basically Netta's family is blocking this and saying that no, she's not coming back down South with you. Leave Netta alone. Netta needs to be up here with us. So what ends up happening is that Peter and the remaining four wives all decide to drive up to D.C. And they show up at Netta's house and they're talking to her and they're saying, Netta, you know, we're a family. The kids miss you. What are you doing? You know, I'll change. We'll make things more comfortable for you. But you can't just leave us. We need you. You're a part of our family. And Netta, once again, being very timid and not having the strongest backbone like her siblings, Netta finally allows them to talk her into going back to Dorm, North Carolina with them. So she packs up her belongings. She tells her mother and her siblings that she'll be okay and that she'll be in touch really soon, but that she needs to get back to the children, that she misses them and they miss her. And Netta ends up getting in the car with all five of them. And that ends up being the last time that her mother or her siblings ever see Netta again. 
So now it's December of 2010. And Netta is back, you know, down south with her sister wives and her crazy husband, Peter. And Netta is noticing that, you know, she's been there a few days now, but she's not seeing Jaden. And as we all know, she loves Jaden. She treats Jaden like, you know, he's her son. And so she goes and she asks Jaden's biological mother, Vania, like, hey, where's Jaden? Where, you know, I haven't seen him. I've been here for a few days now. Where's he at? I see all the other kids. And Vania is like, oh, you know, she really doesn't care. She doesn't seem concerned. She's like, oh, Jaden's with the babysitter. Um, you know, he's going to spend the holidays with the babysitter. And that is like, that's weird. Like what babysitter? Technically, I'm the babysitter or one of the other wives of the babysitter. Who else will be taking care of the children? That doesn't make any sense. So now Netta's kind of worried, like alarm bells are kind of raising in her head. Like, where is Jaden? It's now been two weeks and no one is even speaking of him. It's now been two weeks and she hasn't seen him. So one night, Netta decides to take a nap on the couch, and she's on the couch napping, and the other sister wives assume that she's asleep, and she hears two of the sister wives discussing how Peter shot Jaden and how they had to make sure everything was cleaned up and that no evidence was left behind. So at this point, once Netta hears this, she realizes this is her second wake-up call, and she needs to get the hell up out of there ASAP. If they can kill a four-year-old innocent child, they'd have no problem killing her and doing her the same way. So at this point, Netta prepares to leave. Now, when Netta left, she promised her family that she'd be in touch and that she would contact them soon enough. It had now been three weeks and nobody, not even her mother, have heard back from Netta. And so now they're getting extremely worried. So now three weeks, turn into a month. The holiday seasons come and go. Netta was very close with her family and she kept in touch with her family very frequently, even though she never really devolved as many details with them as to what was going on over the years. She definitely kept in touch with her mother. So for them to not hear from Netta during the holiday seasons, during the new year, they were very, very concerned. So now at this point, Netta's sister Janaya decided to call Peter. So she called Peter and she's like, you know, where's my sister? We haven't heard from her since you guys came and took her away. And Peter basically gave Janaya like this real dismissive answer and said, well, hey, you know, she's been busy at work. Um, I'll tell her to give you guys a call. But, you know, she's busy living her life. When she decides to call y'all, she'll call y'all. But I can't make her do what she doesn't want to do. So now at this point, Janaya and the mother are like really curious and they're thinking to themselves, this makes no sense. Why would she not be calling us? And why do you have to tell her to call us when she had been calling us any other time? So now on top of calling Peter, they've also been texting Netta and they've noticed that the replies that have been coming back do not match how Netta talks. Usually Netta always ends her messages with her mother. I love you, mom. In the past few weeks that they've been getting text messages, that has not been a part of the text messages. It's just been regular messages being sent. So they knew something was not right. So now sometime in January, Netta's phone ends up getting disconnected because no one is paying the bill. So now her family have no way to get a hold of her. They don't know where Peter lives. And at this point, it's just a waiting game. So now we fast forward to February of 2011. And one of the sister wives, her name is Zaina, and she's Peter's fourth wife. She was the last one before Netta came onto the scene. And she ends up running away from the house and she ends up running to the police station. At this point, Zaina can no longer take the abuse. She's tired of it and she's scared and she starts telling the police everything that peter is not only abusing her and the other women but that peter is also a murderer and that there are two people missing and that the police need to investigate right away so the police end up pulling up to the house after being told that netta and Jaden are missing they end up talking to the other sister wives and none of them would cooperate with the police Basically, the other sister wives are making it seem like, you know, they have no idea what Zayna is talking about, that Zayna is basically crazy. She's making things up. And so the police are kind of stumped because they have one woman telling this crazy story of murder and abuse. And then you have these other women who are in the household saying that everything is a lie. So at this point, the police decide to start their own investigation and they start sweeping through the property. 
They end up finding bullets lodged in the bathroom wall. They find blood in the garage. And then on top of that, they find Jaden's baby book basically tossed in the trash as if he never existed. So at this point, the police are growing weary and they feel like something had to have happened. Even though the police found the baby book, the bullet, and some forensics, it still wasn't enough blood to state that somebody died. It could have just simply been a cut. It wasn't a whole bunch of blood. So they needed more evidence to prove that these two people were missing. And soon, God himself would reveal that evidence. On June 8th of 2011, a landlord is called to Peter Moses' mother's house. There's a foul smell coming from the backyard, and the landlord is very confused about the smell. He's thinking it might be a plumbing issue, so he ends up calling some plumbers to dig into the reason why the backyard is emanating the smell that Peter Moses' mother called about. So he hired two plumbers to go and check the plumbing line to find out what was going on, why this terrible smell was emanating from like the backyard area of the house. And as the plumbers were digging, they found a trash bag with a child's body in it. They found several trash bags with human remains in the backyard. And upon further investigation and forensics, it was found out that those were the bodies of Netta and Jaden. They had been buried in the backyard within weeks of each other. Peter Lucas Moses Jr. was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. But of course, like the loser he is, he was not going to go down on his own. He was not going to go down on that sinking ship by himself. He also ended up snitching on the other sister wives as well. And this is what he told police. He said in October of 2010, LaRonda basically walked in on Jaden, allegedly touching on one of the other little boy's bottoms. And as soon as she saw Jaden touching the little boy's butt, uh, LaRonda, you know, she said she was really disturbed and that maybe Jaden may be gay. So at that point, she went and told Peter of what Jaden did. Now, remember, Jaden is a five year old child. And a five-year-old child, they don't understand what they're doing. Most likely they're just playing, popping each other. They're not thinking sexual at five years old. But again, this is what happens when you're in a cult-like environment where, you know, the littlest things get taken to the extreme. So instead of having a talk with Jaden and telling Jaden about inappropriate touching and, and keeping his hands to himself, they decide to take matters into their own hands. So at this point, Peter says he's done whooping Jaden. He's done with the punishments, that Jaden is basically incorrigible. He's hard-headed and he'll never change. So Peter ends up taking Jaden into the garage and he sets the little boy on the cold floor while he blasts his Hebrew scriptures, okay? He has the scriptures turned all the way up and the scriptures are playing over and over and over again for hours. The little boy is obviously just, you know, crying. He's upset. He doesn't understand what's going on. And at that point, Peter walks up to little Jaden while he's sitting on the floor crying. With these Hebrew scriptures being played at full blast, he grabs his gun. He puts it to Jaden's temple and he pulls the trigger, killing the young boy instantly. After he kills Jaden, he goes on with the rest of his day like nothing mattered. And he basically orders LaRonda and LaVeda to clean up the mess and dispose of the body. So at this point, they haven't buried Jaden's body. He's just in trash bags. And so Peter ends up having them put the trash bags in the attic. But because the smell is like, you know, permeating through the house, it's smelling horrible. Uh, Vania is keeping silent. She doesn't care one way or another. They decide to come up with a plot to then bury Jaden's body in the back of Peter's mother's yard. So it was Peter's mother's backyard that Jaden was buried at. And Peter's mother had no idea about this. So when the smell started coming from her backyard is why she caught her landlord. And that is why the landlord caught the plumber, who in turn discovered both of these bodies. Netta was murdered was because she was trying to escape. 
So like I told you guys, she was on the couch and she overheard the sister wives talking about the murder of Jaden and how they disposed of the body. So at this point, Ned is like, you know what? I made a mistake. I should have never came back. I should have stayed in D.C. And so she goes running out the house in just a nightgown and some slippers. And so the other sister wives tell Peter that Netta has run out the house. And at this point, Netta is running up the block. She's pounding on people's doors. She's trying to get somebody to open the door to let her in, but nobody is answering. So Peter orders the other wives to go grab her right now and bring her back in the house. So the other wives end up catching up to Netta and they drag her back in the house and they bring her upstairs to the bathroom. So at this point, Peter then ties Netta up to a chair in the bathroom and he's basically using Netta as an example to show the other women, this is what will happen to each and every one of you guys if you guys defy me and try to escape. So while Netta is tied to the chair, Peter is basically beating her. He's punching her. I mean, he's just wreaking havoc on her body. Netta is screaming. She's crying. And all of the sister wives are just sitting here watching this. So now at this point, Netta is crying. And Peter asks the other wives, do you guys agree that we should take her out? She has now become a headache, just like Jaden. And all of the other wives slowly raise their hand in agreement that Netta should be killed. So now Netta is crying and she's praying and she's, you know, saying that I thought we were supposed to be family. I'm supposed to be one of your sisters. I'm supposed to be your wife. How can y'all agree to kill me? And so at that point, LaRonda ends up bringing in the same, you know, music box and they end up turning on the scriptures super loud. They have it playing throughout the house. These are the same scriptures that played for little Jaden. And Netta's unaware of this because she wasn't there when Jaden was killed. So they have the music playing super loud. And each one of these women start taking turns beating on Netta. So all the sister wives are now taking turns punching her, kicking her, hitting her, and just abusing her while she's in this chair crying and begging for her life. Soon the beating stops. And Netta is thinking to herself, hopefully this is it. You know, we can just go back to life as normal. But then Peter walks in the doorway and he tells Vania to come close. And he gives Vania the 22. This is the same 22 that Peter used to kill Vania's son, Jaden. He hands the gun to Vania and tells Vania, you need to kill Netta right now. At that point, Vania walks up to Netta and Netta is crying and screaming. I can only imagine what is going through her head. This is a woman who thought that she found a family that loved and cared about her, only to find out that she was amongst the den of devils. Vania pulls out the gun. She puts it straight to Netta's head and she pulls the trigger and Netta dies instantly. At that point, Peter tells the women to dispose of her body. So Peter admits to all of this. He implicates all of his sister wives. Peter is then charged with murder. He ends up being sentenced in June of 2013. He pled guilty to murdering both Netta and Jaden, and he received two consecutive life sentences. Now, as far as the sister wives, they were also charged with second degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy to murder. Levada received 16 years for her involvement, LaRonda received 25 years in prison, and Vania received 30 years in prison. Miss Yvonne, who is Netta's mother, got a chance to speak in court, and this is what she had to say to the court. She says, there's not a day that I don't think about her. She's resting in God's arms now. That is the only thing that gives me closure. There will come a time when I can forgive you, Peter, but I have not gotten to that stage now. If I don't forgive you, God can't forgive me and I can't see my child again. This is a nightmare. I hope that this story brings awareness to you guys on how dangerous and manipulative cults can be. Jaden and Netta, you know, they were both victims of this cult. They both loved each other dearly. And unfortunately, both of them never got to enjoy the rest of their lives due to the manipulation and the godlike complex of somebody like Peter Moses. Netta and Jaden both longed for love and they both deserved it. 
but unfortunately they didn't get what they had longed for. And I hope this is a wake up call to many people to listen to your first instinct. Never be so smitten by anyone, male or female, that you don't put yourself first. If somebody can lie to you about something as serious as having multiple wives and multiple children, they are not the ones for you. I know a lot of people are popularizing polygamy and polygamy and you know polyamory and all the other poly stuff. And understand a lot of these relationships are innocent, but some of these relationships are based on manipulation, possessiveness, and control. So ladies, take care of yourselves and don't be scared to put yourself first in a relationship. Thank you once again for tuning in to True Crime Tea Time. Until next time, I'm your host, Lovely T. Enjoy your day and stay safe. Bye. So haunting, so chilling. Come quick, the tea here is spilling. You wanted to come to me. Disgusting crimes and unsolved mysteries. It's true crime tea time. The state's dark history. It's true crime tea time.